He's going to be talking about change in exponential times, or leadership in exponential times. Uh, we're going to bring on board, but real quick bio, come on up, David. Uh, he is um, not only the CIO for the FCC, he started public service when he was 15. He's got two postdocs, um, and he's also been one of the most influential leaders in the public sector. Please welcome Dr. David Bray. Thank you, Rand. So generally, I like to set the bar low so I can exceed expectations, and so that's kind of humbling, but I'll try to uh, meet your expectations. And I want to talk to you about the importance of change agents specifically in exponential times. And with that, first question I want to ask you is, who knows what this is a photo of? Anybody? It's a flak jacket, exactly. Thank you, Zachary. It's a flak jacket, and the reason why I want to show you that is we often confuse the difference between management and leadership. Management is when you do what's expected of you, whether it's from your boss, your peers, or your reports, or in the case of public service, from the public, the Congress, or the administration. We all have expectations put upon us. But at the same time, if we only meet expectations, particularly in a rapidly changing world, we will fall behind. And so what I want to share with you is the difference, which is leadership, which comes from the Greek word lead, which means to be sent unto death. And that's because back in ancient Greece, the leads were the ones that carried a flag in front of the melee army, and that's all well and good until one melee army meets another melee army, and the first to die are the leads. Nelson Mandela said his most trying moment as a leader was when he had to turn around to his own party, the African National Congress, and convince them to make peace with the white minority. He almost had a coup. Isaac Rabim, an Israeli, when he turned to his own Israeli citizens and said we were going to make peace with the Palestinians, unfortunately was assassinated by a fellow Israeli. And so when you're going to step outside of expectations and be a leader, you're going to have to wear your flak jacket. And even more importantly, if you're going to be a change agent, you're going to actually have to figure out how do you illuminate the way to go beyond the status quo but bring others along with you. Now, if there's three things I want you to walk away with today, first, is that we need change agents now more than ever. Two, the reasons why is because our world is changing exponentially. And three, particularly when we talk about public service, I want to convince you that the word government is an increasingly outdated 20th century term. And instead, we need to use the word public service, which includes all of us as members of the public, private sector partners, and government professionals combined. So on the exponential era change, this is a photo of our planet, 7.7 sorry, 3.7 billion miles away. It took five and a half hours for sunlight to be reflected from our planet for Voyager 1 to take that photo, and another five and a half hours to send the radio waves back. It was taken in 1990, and it's worth thinking about how our world has changed since Voyager 1 was launched, took this photo to today. So back in 1977, when Voyager 1 launched, there were 4.2 billion human beings on the face of the planet. And for those of you who remember, the Apple II went on sale with a whopping four kilobytes of RAM. <laughs> hoo hoo, exactly, which could probably play nowadays maybe about two or three seconds of an MP3 file at best. That was the world of 1977. Fast forward to the world of 1990. By that time, it's now traveled 3.7 billion miles for Voyager 1. And we're at about 5.3 billion human beings on the face of the planet. GDP has tripled to now 22 trillion US dollars. Windows 3.0 goes on sale that year. And for those of you who remember, a young Tim Berners-Lee turns on the first web server ever in December of 1990. Any guesses as to how many web servers are on the face of the planet today? Just web servers. Do I hear 10 million? 100 million? 1 billion, exactly. And the last 150 million came online in the last 18 months. That's not linear change. This is exponential change. I want to pause at the year 2013, however, because that's a year that I think we're going to look back and realize was history in the making, even though we didn't actually recognize it. It was the year there was the same number of network devices on the face of the planet as there were humans. 7.1 billion human beings, 7.1 billion network devices. Of course, we know what's happened in the last week with those network devices. GDP again has tripled. And there's four zettabytes, four billion terabytes of data on the face of the planet in 2013. Now, put that in perspective, the Library of Congress is 10 terabytes. So when I talk about four zettabytes, I'm talking about 400 million versions of the Library of Congress on the face of the planet. Now, some of them are cat photos, some of them are YouTube videos, in fact, a lot of them are. But I raise that because it raises interesting questions about where we're going next. 
So now let's fast forward to less than six years from now, the world of 2022. Estimates are anywhere between conservatively 75 billion, upwards of 300 billion network devices on the face of the planet. Eight billion human beings on the face of the planet. Fortunately, we're not growing exponentially. And about 85% of them will have access to the internet. Right now, less than half do. And in terms of digital content, we are now looking at 96 zettabytes, 9.6 billion versions of the Library of Congress on the face of the planet. Google search will no longer work at that point because we won't go past the first or second or third pages of search results. We're going to have to think about how things are aware of the activity you're doing at work or at play or in other types of tasks and says, I see you're working on this activity. Would this information be useful to you? And it has to figure out how not to deluge you and at the same time be relevant and actually then learn from you and actually figure out what things you want, what things you don't want, and when do you want them in what context. This is all going to happen in the less than six years. It's going to strain private sector organizations, public sector organizations alike. Now, I come right now from the world of public service. I've also served in the private sector. And I define public service as what we, the people, choose to do together that we can't do alone. And it really gets to the importance of you. Again, earlier I said that the word federal government is an increasingly outdated term. Let me illustrate this for you. How many of you would, if you could trust that your information would be treated privately and anonymously, be willing to volunteer data on air quality, water quality, transportation quality, or energy quality if it made your local neighborhood safer or healthier? That, to me, is the world we need to think about. This is the world we need to think about in which now it's not the case that packet latency between New York and DC is three days by horseback as it was in 1770. Nowadays, packet latency between New York and DC we know is milliseconds or anywhere else in the world. Your smartphone, if you have a smartphone, and I imagine most of these people in the room do, has more computing power, according to some, than President Reagan had in 1981 available to him through the Pentagon. And that the next one billion people on the face of the planet that are going to get a smartphone are going to get it for less than 45 bucks. That, to me, is an interesting idea that we need to reinvent how we do these things that we, the people, want to do together so it doesn't have to be done just by government professionals. It can be done by the public, it can be done by private sector partnerships, or by government professionals, and in fact, it will work best when it's done by all three collaboratively. Now, again, we have to think about building bridges, and traditionally, we've not done horizontally well. Private sector horizontal is challenging when you work with another company, because that might be either antitrust or even to your profit margin. Same thing is true in the public sector. Unfortunately, our founders said very intentionally, and they were very wise, they wanted ambition to counter ambition. They actually wanted checks and balances, and collaborating horizontally is not something that the federal government is designed to do well. In fact, there's this thing called the Economy Act that says if I use my money to help another agency, that's a felony, and I'm going to jail. So until we address that, it's going to be hard to build these bridges, but it's needed now more than ever in the world we're facing. And when the Constitution was signed, supposedly Ben Franklin remarked that he could rest easy knowing the great American experiment would exist for the next 50 years. Now, obviously, that was 240 years ago. And I think it's most interesting he chose the word experiment. Because experiment and expertise both come from the Greek word experia, meaning out of danger. And that the only way you get expertise is you do dangerous things, which are experiments, which by their nature won't always work out. The challenge is, is why are Silicon Valley, Austin, Texas, Boston, Seattle, Washington, other innovation hubs get that they have to do experiments, and they do this. How many of have the patience for us to do experiments in government and have them not work out after the second or third try? There's this expectation that everything we do has to work the first time all the time. And that creates a risk-averse culture. And so the question is, how are we going to continue that great American experiment and that great world experiment called representative democracy if we can't do experiments moving forward. So I'm going to give you three principles real quick, recognizing I'm standing between you and lunch. This is ultra condensed. We can have conversations later. First, the power of diversity. There are times when crowds trump experts. In fact, it was shown in a 2002 study that if you bring together a group of experts and you bring a group of experts plus what they call naive participants, so no expertise at all in the subject matter, the winners will be the experts plus the naive participants. This was a National Academy of Science study. And what they show is when you become an expert, 
What you're really doing is you're learning to see the world through certain heuristics, certain viewpoints, and that's great. That's what makes you an expert. The challenge is it also blinds you to seeing the world in certain ways, too. Frank Lloyd Wright, an amazing architect, unfortunately an awful engineer, his buildings are now falling apart. It would have been much better to pair Frank Lloyd Wright with a great engineer, maybe also a great conservationist, and you would have ended up with a much better product from the diversity of their expertise as opposed to just having a great architect or a pool of architects. A diverse crowd has more tools to apply. Now, I share that, however, because the times when diversity works versus falls apart is when leadership sets shared goals up front at the beginning. If you don't set shared goals up at the beginning, you'll have fragmentation, you'll have splintering. You may have what we're currently seeing around the world in certain schemes, I'll leave it to your imagination, where groups are not working together on shared goals with the diverse problem set and the diverse tools that they bring. So that's first the power of diversity. Two, now I want to talk to you about power of the edge. Back in 2000, I joined what was called the Bioterrorism Preparedness Response Program at the US Centers for Disease Control. I joined it, I was one of 30 people. We were there because the sarin gas attacks had happened in 1990. There had also been vials of smallpox stored in some former Soviet republics, and we couldn't find them all. And we were trying to do what would happen if a really bad day happened, and what technology would assist. Now, for those who remember, the Agile Manifesto came out in March of 2001. Hopefully people remember that. I was an early proponent. However, I was being told, get back in my box, buy into the five-year plan, do waterfall development, as it is, you've got to wait three years so you get a congressional appropriation. Agile has no place here. And my response was, well, we're not, we don't have a deal with the terrorists not to strike until we've actually got all our systems online. And as it was, I was a heretic, and I was actually supposed to brief the CIA and the FBI on September 11th, 2001, at 9 o'clock in the morning as to what we would do technology-wise should a bioterrorism event happen. Of course, 834, the world changed. I didn't get to give that briefing. Didn't sleep for three weeks. We piled computers into cars. We dealt with the response to 9-11. Stood down on October 1st. I briefed the CIA on October 3rd. First case of anthrax shows up 24 hours later. That, to me, shows that fortunately we had done some agile development and we had some basic tools to deal with the response to New York, DC, and Florida. But what I also saw was, unfortunately, people resorting back to hierarchies. We were only 30 people in an organization of 15,000, and that was just the CDC. Imagine the rest of the US federal government. According to some, there's 50 different agencies involved when a bioterrorism event happens. Hierarchies, unfortunately, lose context as to the environment they're facing. If something has to percolate up the hierarchy to get back down or other parts of the organization, it will be too slow. Plus, when I was trying to pitch Agile, I was on the edge and I saw what fit my context. Maybe other places needed the three or five year plan, maybe not but I was not allowed to because the hierarchy was trying to enforce their views which were out of date of the world we were facing. And so if I leave you with the idea of empowering the edge, which is recognize the edge has better situational awareness of what's needed than the top of the hierarchy. And so if you're a manager, cultivate the insights of your reports, figure out which ones are best, and pass them both peer-wise as well as up the chain as opposed to just enforcing your view down the hierarchy. Lastly, this one is the power of an ecosystem. And I imagine most of you recognize the power of the ecosystem in terms of what we've seen with Google Apps, the iOS store, but I want to convince you we need to do this as humans too. The problems we now face, these challenges we face globally, don't fit into any one organization. It's going to require us to work across teams we don't have direct control of. It's going to require us, again, to work across private sector, members of the public, and government professionals. And so when you don't have direct control over teams, how do you motivate, how do you move people forward? And what I would submit to you is, we don't tell ants where to go. We sprinkle sugar in certain places. We sprinkle other chemicals in other places for them to avoid. And eventually, the ants explore the space and figure out on their own the best place to get to the sugar. But you don't tell them where to go. You're using nudges. You're using indirect influences. And that's what's needed with an ecosystem, because increasingly, the challenges we face, the ones that are worth solving, will not fit into any one organization and is going to require us to figure out what are the incentives, what are the motivations, what are the trust factors that move teams forward. Now, returning back to the idea that leaders are individuals that are willing to step outside of expectations, take risk, and learn from them. Who knows who this is a photo of? I'll give you a hint, US Navy. 1904, that's a young Ensign Nimitz. 
Ensign Nimes with the U.S. Navy ran his abode aground in 1904, the USS Decatur in the Philippines. He was court-martialed, but not drummed out of the Navy, and was instead signed to submarines. And 35 years later, he was one of two five-star admirals we ever had, helped us win the war in the Pacific. But I share that because pause for a moment and think, if this had happened nowadays, if a lieutenant and lieutenant commander had run their boat aground in the Philippines, how long on Twitter and Facebook would have been fire Nimitz? How many news pundits and comedians would have been actually saying, how could he have possibly done that? And his boss, his boss's boss, probably would have been called before Congress, and they would have all been drummed out. In fact, I recently found out that US naval regs actually now have a rule that says one strike, you're automatically out if you run your boat aground. We, the public, deserve the public service we get. If we are not tolerant of people that make mistakes and learn from them, that people that take risk and see if those pay out, then don't be surprised if we, the public, are selecting for risk-averse leaders, and then we're surprised when nothing is getting done in an exponential era. I share the story of Ensign Nimitz, because that's what we need going forward. So again, hopefully I've convinced you that the world is changing exponentially, but let me reinforce that even more by showing you this photo from 1969 of all of six nodes on the ARPA internet, American Southwest. By the time you get to 1982, now the good news is the United States is beginning to get connected. Again, these are very slow baud rates. But we also have a transatlantic and transpacific cable. By the time you get to 1993, the good news is Europe and the United States increasingly connected. These are even just landlines beginning to connect to the rest of the world by the time you get to 2007, they give up actually trying to draw borders on the map. And by the time you get to 2010, they even give up trying to draw a map at all. Wow. To me, the world we're going into is going to call in questions about what's the national border? Is it where the packet is sent from? Is it where the packet is received by? How do we enforce those laws? This is going to call into the questions as to how we address this exponential era. And again, that's why I emphasize the word federal government, increasingly an outdated term. What we need to think about is how do we do public service that is all of us choosing to do the things we want to, plus the private sector and government professionals. So let me leave you with four quick examples of what we might do in this new era as experiments to move forward. First, at the FCC, I came in in 2013. There had been nine CEOs in eight years. I was number 10, which is always a good sign for number 10 when you've had that rate of change. And we wanted to do an experiment, which was could we crowdsource the collection of data in terms of were you getting the broadband speed that was promised to you by the ISPs? Now, you can imagine coming out and saying, hi, I'm with the US government. Would you like to download an app that will monitor your connection speed and share these results to the FCC in 2013? probably would not be that successful. But what we did was we made the app open source. We put the code on GitHub. The terms and conditions were only two pages long. And if you looked at the code, you saw that by design, we did not collect your IP address. By design, we didn't know who you were in a five mile radius. And as a result, having those only two page long terms and conditions, which again, I would challenge, when was the last time you ever agreed to anything on the internet that short? It was the fourth most downloaded app right behind Google Chrome for a while. We saw the entire nation wanting to actually provide data and actually inform policymaking because they knew that we had done privacy and security by design. Now think about what happened in New York about a month ago. That in some respects was also crowdsourcing, trying to find a suspect. There may be other activities, air quality, water quality, that if you knew for sure that your information would be both private and anonymous, you'd be willing to have it inform making your community healthier and safer. Second. How many people have heard of Crisis Commons? Crisis Commons actually got started in 2007. It was actually used when the earthquake happened in Haiti. It's the idea that anyone with an SMS or smartphone can share data about what they're seeing. They can say this bridge is down, power line is down, I need hospital beds over here, I need food. Or it could even be if something violent's going on, that we're seeing violence over here, there's an attack going here, we need first responders. Now, anyone can do that. So that means a few people can do misinformation, or they can even intentionally try to do misinformation. But because it's the many eyes approach, eventually it balances itself out. And when the earthquake happened in Haiti, there were two sisters, one of which was nine months pregnant, that tried to start getting the sister to the hospital because she was going into labor. And along the way, her other sister who was driving would update using our SMS phone to Facebook saying, bridge is down, can't go here, there's flooding, I need to actually bypass this way. And there was a US Navy hospital ship that was watching Crisis Commons and actually got the information referral and were able to send a six-person team, pick up the two women, bring them back to the hospital ship, and she was able to successfully give birth. 
This is the idea of what David Brin calls surveillance from the bottoms up as opposed to surveillance from the top. And again, think about what events. If you could make your sporting event safer and you knew what was being done with the data, would you be willing? Other things like that that we need to think about so it's a sense of empowering people, much like we've heard about what we need to do for customers. What can we also do for citizens and people of the world so they have a participation in this larger public service? It's not just done by a few people. Third, this may have sounded outlandish about two or three years ago. Now it's becoming a little more mainstream. But in 2013, there was a competition to see if anyone would write an algorithm that would grade papers as good as a third grade teacher. For $60,000, someone won that competition, was a hedge fund trader, could find the same sentence mistakes, same mathematical errors, and correct it. 2014, Xerox comes out with a copier. Take a handwritten test, handwritten answers, grade it for the teacher with no programming a priori. 2015, a hedge fund actually elects to its board of directors an algorithm and gives it voting rights. 2015 as well, IBM and other companies are actually testing their AI to see which meetings you should go to, which meetings you should not go to, and if you do go to those meetings, who should go with you. 2016, interesting enough, California is actually testing an AI to help set bail decisions. You feed in the facts of the case, and it actually gives you an outcome. Now, the nice thing about that, it doesn't take into account things that are not relevant. It doesn't need to know your height, your weight, your race, your gender. Those things aren't relevant to setting the bail decision, and so in some respects, it's more fair. And we may even need to think about, can we make that algorithm open? Also in 2016, there's another competition now to see if anyone can write an AI that will answer real estate law questions as good as a real estate lawyer, because it's very rule-based. And right now, it's about 80% accurate. The world we're going into will begin to take some of those things that are rote, routine, and rule-based, which is a lot of public service because we want it to be fair. But in the past, we protracted the process and made it so long because no one person could bias the system. If you can make the AI open, that could be a way of actually having answers in milliseconds, and at the same time, people can see what the algorithm is doing and know that it's fair. This will transform public service. This will transform the work we do together in the world and nations. And lastly, how many people have heard of the makers movement? I would imagine most of the people at this conference have. But if you've not, it's the idea that tools and technologies that used to be only available to individuals are ending up in the hands now, oh, sorry, in the nation states are now in the hands of individuals. Examples include like the Raspberry Pi, the Raspberry Zero. For less than five bucks, you can get the computing power that used to be only available, say, to the Pentagon 30 or 40 years ago. And you can do interesting things with it. That photo over there, those three women were able to, for less than 45 bucks, produce a urine-powered generator so their community could read at night and they could read their books and get educated. The other photo over there, for less than 60 bucks, using an SNS flip phone, we're able to actually produce a baby monitor that can monitor 40 different vital signs and send it to any doctor in the world in near real time. Now, that's the good side of the makers movement, that we can increasingly make things available in areas that could not afford those things that were only available to large nation states or corporations. The downside is the Mumbai terrorist attacks that happened. They use the same tools in, that you and I use on our daily basis. They use web search. They use GPS. They unfortunately use social media to figure out how to plan and unfortunately execute their victims when they did their terrorist attack. Technology itself is amoral. It's how we choose how to use it that decides whether it's good or bad. And so while we are super empowering individuals in this exponential era, we need to be ready for not everyone to use it for good ends. And this is a question that we need to ask ourselves, which is how do we do the future of national security? How do we do the future of providing public service? How do we do the future of making sure our communities are healthy and safe? And it's going to require all of us to give input, again, with diverse perspectives that empower the edge and embrace the ecosystem. Just to give you one more sense of the size of the scale that we are experiencing, Internet Protocol version 4, which is 4.3 billion numbers. That's how we used to address numbers on the Internet. We ran out about 10 months ago. 4.3 billion addresses. It's basically the phone lookup for websites. If you take all those numbers and put them in a beach ball, any guesses as to how big Internet Protocol version 6, what we're adopting now and will continue to adopt for the next five years, is? I'll give you a hint. It's 2 to the 128th. The Internet that you've known is the beach ball. The Internet that you will know will be the size of the sun. Again, put this in perspective of what happened last week. 
and recognizing that technology is amoral. So a lot will use it for good, some will use it for mundane purposes, some will use it for not so good purposes. This will strain how we do the work of nations, of communities, and the world, and it's needed for us to talk about it together because no one person has all the answers. One closing thought. This is again a photo of our planet, the pale blue dot, taken in 2013 when NASA's Cassini passed by Saturn. And back in 1994, Carl Sagan said, that's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, every human being you ever heard of was there, lived out their lives. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. We're going to need more change agents for exponential times. Thank you for your attention, and I'll send you off to lunch.